Pillow County Carlow has witnessed many historic events. Set in rich agricultural land, it has been a place of education and learning, and many of its sons and daughters have gone on to great things. This film, however, concentrates on commerce, a building, this building, which for more than 150 years has served the people of Tullow and beyond. PJ Duffy's Drapery is one of the oldest businesses operating in Tullow County, Carlow. Duffy's Drapery continues trading to this day. Based on Mill Street and the Old Chapel Lane, it is a reminder of times past. Slater's Business Directory of 1891 lists the building trading as a pawnbroker and bicycle shop, owned by Daniel Norse. The 1901 census curiously has no occupants of the building. The 1911 census lists the building as a drapery business under the management of Philip and Elizabeth Lazenby, who rented the building under lease. Late in 1912, a Miss Frances Barrington bought the building. Miss Barrington had previously been the manager of Lewis's Drapery Shop in Newtown Barry, now known as Buntlody. Miss Barrington had entered the Lewis business due to the early death of a senior member of the family. When the next generation was old enough to manage the business, she decided to start trading in the drapery business on her own account. She found a suitable premises in the former pawnbroker shop of the Nurse family in Mill Street, Tullow. Although it does not appear too unusual today, it must really have been quite remarkable in the rural Ireland of a hundred years ago to see a woman come to an area as a stranger, her family background would have been from Stradbally, and take over a business with every intention of competing with the businessmen of the town. The new businesswoman soon became well known in Tullow and it is said one of her first instructions to shop staff was no second price. This was based on her belief that the marked price represented excellent value and all her goods were of the highest quality. Of course this no-nonsense trading would have been marked contrast to most shopkeepers of the time who were accustomed to quite an amount of haggling before a sale could be agreed. At the time, the pony and trap were the main providers of rope transport, and the average person would consider themselves very mobile if they were fortunate enough to possess a reliable bicycle. To run a successful drapery business, it was necessary for Miss Barrington to make numerous trips to Manchester and other places. This involves starting out from Tullow Station and crossing on the mail boat. One simple buying expedition meant several days away instead of the hours one would think of today. Tullow had joined the railway age on the 1st of June, 1886. Miss Barrington's journey would have taken her through seven intermediate stations, joining the main line at Nace. Miss Barrington would have arrived at Kingsbridge Station, now Houston, and connected to the mail boat at the North Wall, Dublin. It was during one of her many trips that she made the acquaintance of the station master, William F. Murdoch. For a good part of her time in business in Tullow, Miss Barrington lived at the Mill Street premises. In those days, most of the staff lived in. There were several reasons for staff living in, but lack of easy transport, combined with the much earlier opening and later closing times, usually 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., six days per week, then prevalent, would have been enough to dampen most people.
people's enthusiasm for home. On the 14th of June, 1923, Miss Frances Barrington married Mr. William F. Murdoch, who was the railway station master in Tullow. In 1925, the now Mrs. Frances Murdoch made a decision to sell the business to P.J. Duffy. P.J. Duffy was from County Roscommon, one of a family of nine children. The early death of his parents hit the family hard. P.J.'s eldest brother cared for the family. They had some lean years. P.J. became very sick as a child and this left him with a slight limp. P.J. Duffy entered the drapery business, eventually settling in a shop in Castle Comer, County Kilkenny, which he managed for 10 years. The owner encouraged P.J. to branch out on his own. He became aware of two shops for sale, one in Tullow and one in Gorey. On a Sunday afternoon, he visited Tullow for the first time. He approached three men sitting on the bridge wall and asked them the following question. Where is the best place in Tullow to buy a suit, shirt and shoes? In unison, they said Barrington's. A decision was made there and then to buy Barrington's shop. P.J. Duffy purchased the property and stock for £1,000. P.J. and his wife, Maya, determined to make their business a major success. P.J. Duffy was a dapper, highly intelligent man, particularly well-read and very ambitious. His generosity to the family and others was well known. P.J. inherited a thriving business retaining many established customers. He continued the one price rule and he continued purchasing from the businesses in Manchester which made catching the mail boat a regular occurrence. The 1920s were a very intense business year and PJ Duffy continued growing his business. PJ Duffy's drapery business struggled through the lean years of the 1930s The 1940s were much busier and the business continued to build on its variety of products and its growing customer base. The 1950s were a great challenge. Mr. and Mrs. Duffy diversified by buying new lines of stock. In 1952, PJ Duffy's nephew, Patrick, joined the business after leaving college. Patrick remained in the business until 1954 when Patrick took up an appointment with Dolce's Shoes in London. In 1957, Canis Kelly joined the business as the first paid apprentice. Canis describes his learning as very intense. The principles of salesmanship he learned at PJ Duffy's stood to him for the rest of his very successful career in business. One former employee, Miss Bridie Keelty from County Cavan, said that she had answered an advertisement in the Irish Independent, arriving in Tullow by bus on the 18th of March 1958. Miss Keelty described her early years as a delight. Duffy's was a lovely place to work, she said. Customer service was very important. Product knowledge essential. In the early part of her employment she lived on the premises. The hours were long but we were so busy we did not not feel the time go by, she added. As Ireland entered the 1960s a new atmosphere of hope and optimism emerged. This time was known as the Kennedy era. Tourism figures were up and the wheels of industry began to turn. Investment paid off, and by the 1960s, PJ Duffy's business began to grow. Many people now worked in local industry. 
Carlo Sugar Factory employed many from Tullow. The local farmers were kept busy supplying beet to the factory. The summer could also be very busy when people returned from England and purchased clothes, shoes and other material. In the 1960s, PJ's health began to fail. His lovely wife, Maya, had worked in the business from the very early days. She now took on the role of his carer. At this time, Michael Raftery became manager, supported by the other department heads. PJ Duffy kept in constant touch with his nephew Patrick. When in December 1965, PJ Duffy asked Patrick to come to Tullow as he was had some business matters which he wished to discuss. When Patrick Duffy arrived in Tullow and met with his uncle PJ, he was amazed to learn that he was going to sign over the business to him. In August 1966, Patrick came back and inherited a thriving business with a staff of nine. Patrick's experience acquired in London and business connections ensured that the shop continued to grow. PJ Duffy and his wife Moya now made plans to retire to a new house in Drogheda. Sadly, this was not to be. PJ Duffy collapsed and died just five days before the scheduled move. Moya Duffy lived a long life. She loved her home in Drogheda. Finally, in 1991, she passed away. Patrick Duffy immediately began the day-to-day -day running of his newly inherited business. Unknown to anyone, Pete Patrick was carrying a secret. In the months before his uncle's message to return, Patrick had begun a relationship with a very beautiful Austrian lady named Hermie. Shortly after Patrick took over the business, Hermie informed Patrick that she had succumbed to a serious illness. Hermie told Patrick that she would not leave London as she was under the best of care it was possible to get. Patrick agonised over this for many months eventually making the decision to sell the business. He advertised in the national press for a buyer. Eileen Doyle takes up the story. Mr. Patrick Duffy came in one day and he announced he was selling up. And it was a big shock to us because he was such a lovely boss and really uh, tr it treated us very well and we were shocked but then we were wondering who we were going to get and would he be as nice or or would we get on with him but um, we met Mr. Mann then um, and he took over then in 68 and um, it was great because he was a great boss too and um, we were like a big happy family and we looked out for one another and customer care was very much the importance in Duffy's. It was all about treating the customer right. In 1968, Arnold Mahan purchased the business from Patrick Duffy. It is here we take up the story with Arnold. My early life, yeah, well, I was born in Benicurry, just outside Carlow Town. And went to school in Benicurry for primary and then went to the CBS in Carlow. And uh, enjoyed that for three or four years. Um, we had a good football team in it and that was my reason for staying in school. I wasn't a very academic person and uh, didn't have any great interest in learning. And uh, I was there because we had a good football team. We won or got to the final of the Midland League, which was unusual for a, a CBS uh, school at the time because a lot of the higher schools were involved in it. 
but uh, then once I, I did the inter and uh, I saw a job advertised in the paper. Didn't know much about it, but uh, I applied to it anyway, and uh, eventually Mr. Evan McDonald, who owned Max Drapery, arrived out in the yard one evening and uh, kind of interviewed me as a just general conversation. And he said, sure, okay, can you start next week? So I jumped at a chance, anything, rather than go back to school. That was it. But uh, enjoyed that. We're farmers, um, my parents were farmers, and uh, usual life, we potted around in the farm and did jobs that had to be done, and it was the usual thing. Um, in the evening time then, the football field was right at our house, Palatine football field, and when you were finished in the evening time, that's where you went, down there and kicked ball around, and that was, that was our social life at the time, there wasn't much else to do. You didn't have any money, you didn't have any facilities for travelling or anything like that. So we just amused ourselves in the football field and stayed there until dark. And that was it. And, but uh, when I went to, went to work at Max anyway, I mean, it was a learning curve for me because I wasn't terribly familiar with uh, shopping. At that time, the parents did all the shopping. We had a place in Carlo. <clears throat> called Malai's was a general shop, like something like here, I mean, on a bigger scale. But uh, they did all the shopping there, practically all the shopping for drapery, anyway. And um, they had an account there and uh, they went in and, like most farmers at that time, they paid once a year, twice a year, whatever it was, whenever they had it, I suppose, and they sold a few sheep or sold a few cattle or whatever, that, that sort of thing. But that was life, we went on there. And, Started working there in Max and uh, learned the hard way, it wasn't easy. You started at nine o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock wasn't five past nine. Could be five to nine, but not five past nine. And you were there till lunchtime. And then you finished at six. And we had a half day on Thursday. And uh, Saturday then was 10 o'clock that time didn't close till 10 o'clock and Saturday night that time was a very busy night. Yeah. So I remained there for a good few years and then in 1960, no 19 what, 1968, uh, I saw an advertisement for a place for sale here and, and well it didn't specify it was by private treaty so eventually we found out where it was and we bought it and been here since 68. First of April, in April Fool's Day, I started here. Good day to start. But I was it, and as, was, as it worked out, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad a day at all. So when I came here, like, when I worked in Max, you see, it was a man shop. It wasn't a general shop. And when I came here, uh, it was a, an eye opener, I can tell you, because they had all sorts of household stuff and haberdashery and ladies footwear and ladies underwear and ladies everything and I had no idea I thought see coming from a shop in Carla I had no at all but I didn't I knew nothing about it so it was a very steep steep learn, learning curve, curve for me but um, fortunately we had a great staff here and they they ran the place for until I got the feel of it for they ran it for a good bit but at that stage I mean this was a brilliant shop uh, at the time that the business that it was phenomenal. I had no idea. I remember coming over Saturday night, one Saturday night, just to have a look at what was going on. And the number of people that were coming and going from the shop with brown parcels that time. It wasn't, there was no plastic bags or anything like that that time. But I could not get over the number of people that were shopping. And that was a Saturday night. <clears throat> Which was the big shopping night, of course. Uh, at that time, there was ten people working full time here, and uh, there could be three maybe on the busy weekends when it was summertime, sale time, all that sort of thing. There could be three extra on a Saturday night. And that'll give you an idea of the business that was done here at that time. It was uh, un unbelievable. But the staff ran the shop then for until I got the feel of it, and uh, they were excellent and they did a great job. And, to, to learn me how to do it, yeah, so, 
That was it, put her. The girls, that was girls, there was, oh, there was three, nine people, yeah, there was three walking in the men's end of it, there was three in the, what we call the haberdasher or the horsey side, and there was three upstairs in the ladies' end of it. And Mara Hogan, as you may remember, Mara was here in the office. She was the boss. She looked after the whole thing. And on Saturday night, and her most days, you remember the cash, the yoke carrying the cash over? She was in the office, little office there where the shoe stand is now. And she handled all the money that time. And there used to be murder people waiting for money, waiting for change and everything. We'd be, we'd be so busy, you wouldn't have time to give change. Or, it, it was crazy, but the people used to they tolerate it. They wouldn't tolerate it now, but they did that time. And uh, Asher was was great, really. And the experience of buying and everything was a whole new ball game to me, like for the all the different departments. But the girls were good. And the lads. Vincent Bourne was in, you might remember Vincent Bourne, he was in the men's end of it and Anthony Kenny, Anthony down the shop there. He was here at the time. Then there was Anne Kyo. Oh, Nellie Murphy, she was uh, originally from, I don't know where she was from, Westford part of it, I think. She was in the ladies' end of it. Eileen Dyle, Eileen Thompson up to Castlemore Road, and uh, Anne, Anne Kyo. They were downstairs, and then there was Lillian Kyo upstairs, and Mary Carroll, and Brima Holden, Brima O'Born, she came with me actually. All the other staff had been, they were fixed here at the time, and Prima was the only new one that came with me, and so we fiddled away for years anyway. Kept out show on the road. The shop at that time, I mean, people were lovely, and the, they were loyal, and the people, you, you could count the people that you knew we were going to be coming in uh, during the week, and they were all very loyal people, and... Yeah, sure, we looked after them, I suppose. They, they appreciated what we did for them and we appreciated the customer. And a lot of people then, if they were short of a bob or something like that, you get a bit of credit and they appreciated that. And it was the times, times that time were tough. Hard on people, it was very hard to survive. Uh, at that time, there was no, you had no, um, you had no uh, seven day trading or you had no online or you had none of the none of that sort of stuff to compete with it was people were loyal to the shops that they went to and it, most of them had particular shops that they shopped in and they were they were lovely lovely people saw the earth the world has changed enormously a different different attitude altogether for people now that they, they, they're very particular very fuzzy uh, much better informed, of course, than what they used to be, and they have much more facilities. They have, they have the travel now. They can travel anywhere they want to, and they have the variety of shops. And you have the shopping centres everywhere where they can go and park the cars. And shopping has become a, more a social event than a natural necessary event. People tend to go. Women, particularly, tend to go for. In the evening out, go for a cup of coffee and uh, do a bit of shopping and root around in the different shops and that, you know. But uh, that's, that's all changed. But the biggest problem is the, the online. That has ruined it at the moment, absolutely destroyed rural businesses. Now, it mightn't affect towns that much, but uh, it has destroyed rural, rural businesses, absolutely. And it's only going to get worse, not going to change. That's the way it is. Oh, not really any special memories, no, just the people. I mean, what I remember most is the people that used to come in and the lovely people to come in and to be happy to have a conversation with you and talk to you. There was no such thing as hurry or panic or anything like that. Now everybody's in a hurry, they haven't time to talk to you. They're all on just phones and yokes. And uh, that time people come in and it's like, talk to you and tell you about their little problems or you know they were, they were interested and the people the people were, were, were the one memory that I would have about a business you know 
the reps, of course, the travellers, the reps were, wouldn't be travellers that time, they were reps that time. And, you know, they were nice people as well, and they helped you run, run your business as best you could. You know, they were, were nice, nice people. But other than that, I wouldn't have anything special, really. It was a good life for me. I liked the life, and I loved the, I loved the whole thing. Really enjoyed it. Like you wouldn't know much about that. And haberdash was another part of it that I didn't know much about, knitting and all that sort of stuff. But uh, ah, we learned as we went along and made made mistakes. And that's that's like fifty years. Um, I came to Duffy's in on the second of November, nineteen seventy-two. It was my first job and my only job. And they're the happiest days that I can um, ever imagine have had. Worked with lovely people. We had uh, it's a general store. Three uh, ladies upstairs. There was three people working downstairs. The haberdashery and bed linen. Three people. Shoe counter, men's counter. Three people and a lady in the office. Everybody got on marvelously well together. We were like one big happy family. We had people coming in here from all over Leinster because Duffy's was renowned for its, uh, shall we say, its textiles, its textures and quality and they had everything that you could imagine and still have most to this day of everything that you could ask for. And if we haven't got it, we try and get it for you. Well, the business at, at sale time, Christmas time, you would be a month getting ready for a sale. You'd have counters littered with boxes of goods for the sale and all great prices. There was all different kind of um, knitwear. We had Gael Tera, we had Dorothy Perkins, Castle, Canella blouses, all the big Dor um, Doreen suits, jackets, all them companies are well and long gone and people watched out because they knew they always got a bargain here and you'd be working as i said for a month beforehand they would be two or three deep at the counter and that is no joking um well i have loads of all my memories are good of being here um one memory i have is of the lady in the post office was Miss Nan McCullough and she was one of our good customers and I remember I was no I was a very about a month here and she came in and she showed me how to wrap parcel properly and how to break twine with your hand and that's something I never forgot to this day.
Connie was the familiar face of Duffy's upstairs. She served her time in Erthangen prior to her move to Tullow. She describes Arnold as the best boss in every way, a very decent man. Connie trained Antoinette and is very pleased and proud of the business being carried on by herself and Anne. The upstairs department carries fashions for ladies and children, along with bedding, curtains and fabrics. Connie describes her customers as always nice. She has a great memory for people's names. She remembers Sister Ursula from the Bridgeline Convent coming to the shop to buy clothing for the sisters. She says the nuns were lovely. Some of the changes Connie has seen are the fashions in clothing and particularly bedding, from blankets to duvets. She always enjoyed the very busy times coming up to Christmas and of course the sales. Her closing remarks are, tell them all I was asking for them. I had happy days. Elsie Murphy lived on the green Tullow with her parents. In 1940, Elsie began work with PJ Duffy's drapery on a three year indenture without pay. Apprentices signed a contract known as an indenture, binding them to serve a master for three years in exchange for learning the trade. Elsie began working in the men's department downstairs. She says the top selling products in the early 1940s were shirts, socks and underwear. Elsie also says that items that always had to be available were gents black funeral armbands and black diamonds for women as these were the custom for mourning at the time. Working hours were long with late opening until 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. Elsie says that in Duffy's at that time, a customer could go into the menswear department to be measured for a suit by Michael Raftery and it would be delivered within a fortnight. Duffy's stocked rolls of material which were supplied to local dressmakers. One person whom Elsie remembers as a very talented dressmaker was a lady named Miss Kinsella who lived on the Castle Lane, Tullow. Elsie recalls Duffy's shop ran a very strict routine. There was no tolerance of lates or leaving five minutes early. The living in employees had to be in their quarters by 10.30 p.m. as the doors were locked. She remembers the names of those who were living in at this time. Michael Raftery, Joe Ockney and Eileen Ford who came from Hackettstown. Elsie gives us a unique insight into life in Tullow in the 1940s. Every person had a ration book with allowances for meat, milk, bread, tea and sugar. She says that most people in Tullow would have grown their own vegetables in their gardens to supplement their rations. Much bartering went on in Tullow at this time. She speaks of ladies nylons being readily available in Duffy's and being sent inside copies of The Nationalist to relatives in England. Elsie describes Tullow at this time as a quiet place, no murders or trouble. It was a good place to live. Her sister Daphne married Michael Raftery. Elsie Murphy worked in Duffy's drapery until 1948.
May I say a very big thank you to all our customers. This is a special moment for our business and we wish you all well in the future. Well, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude for this project that you have embarked upon and to allow me to participate for the limited period of time that I spent in Tullow. I spent twice as I was worked in Tullow, first from 52 to 54, from my uncle. Things didn't work out, went to London, then he asked me to come back, and it was a great privilege to come, come back, but somehow it didn't work out again, but nevertheless, a great affection for Tullo and got to know the Tullo people very well, and so many times over the years since I left in 68, I've been back to Tullo, and it always gives me a nice feeling to be back, because I've got many, many happy memories from the four years in total that, that I spent in Tullo. And again, my thanks to you for allowing me to be part of this, and Christy as well, two fine gentlemen. And I'm, in my, it is my wish that we are friends for the rest of my life.